So please tell me, where does a lonely soul like me begin to tell the stories, the tall tales, and the absolute fabrications of a town that dared to change its name in the 1950s, no less, to truth or consequences? Tell me, my friends, tell me, my listening friends, would you use such a name in your life? Would you say you were welcoming in a newly engaged couple into your business, would you use the name Truth or Consequences Bridal Shower? <laughs> Bridal Boutique? No, you would not. Would you use the title if you were welcoming or counseling a bereaved family coming to your business, Truth or Consequences Funeral Parlor and <laughs> Crematorium? No, I do not think you would. So what's going on? What was happening at that time in the world, a place that would do that? So that's some of what we're going to be exploring tonight. Um, did you know that it actually has been voted on three times to change the name? One to change it and twice to change it back. <laughs> Each time it has been closer and closer to changing the name back. So if anyone should come up with the idea of changing it one more time, they may just be successful. But did you know that at, in the day it was considered so outrageous that there was a lawsuit against the city, talk about shades and rhyming of history, that they had done it illegally, that the vote was illegal. It was thrown out by a judge at some point and was stayed and stood. The vote was something like about 1,100 to 300. So people were overwhelmingly in favor of it, but it was very controversial. And did you know that out of the mouth of babes comes wisdom? Because the, the high schoolers of Hot Springs High School also voted on whether they should change the name or not and they voted to not change the name. So to this day, we have Hot Springs High School versus Truth or Consequences, the town. So. Oh, dang, good for them. <laughs> yes, good for them. Um, so um, a few welcoming things. So uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I was told there were gonna be some ladies and gentlemen here tonight. I'm not sure, especially when I look at the crowd. And I also heard that tonight there is a sheep shearing contest at the, at the county fairgrounds. And I thought certainly all the gentlemen and ladies would go to that event. And then I also heard that there, and this is a true fact, there is a public hearing tonight at the exact same time as this for the I-25 interchange with South Broadway. And what can be more exciting than lane closures and weightage and painting stripes and all that kind of thing? So I didn't really expect any crowd here tonight. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. So <clears throat> my name is Dimit Hayes, and I have been, I first came to Truth or Consequences about 40 years ago. Uh, I have been living here for the past 25, 26 years and consider Truth or Consequences my home. New Mexico is my adopted state, but uh, TRC is my home. I want to be clear because I know there are some lifelong residents born and raised in the audience. So I'm, this is my take on it. I'm an amateur historian. I'm not professionally trained. The title should maybe really be the things that interest Dimmit about the history of truth or consequences. <laughs> so this is not going to be chronological. It's not going to be heavy date based. It's going to be thematic and things that I find of interest, uh, such as my opening statements about how absurd uh, it was when the name was proposed and changed. I've always thought when I would start really seriously doing history on TRC, the thing that would be most fascinating was the period when the three economies, and we will talk about those later, uh, started to be shut down by the state and what happened economically to the town. But about a month ago, I started really getting serious about research for this, and I went into Geronimo Springs Museum, and we will talk about that a little bit, uh, and actually started looking at the original set of the Herald, the Hot Springs Herald newspaper that you know recently closed a few years ago, but they have a complete set of the papers, and was actually going in and, and found the literally the copy, it was a weekly, when the, the hub subheading was uh, Hot Springs Herald, Hot Springs, New Mexico, the very next week's later issue was Hot Springs Herald, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. So there was actually a defining point where the paper changed its name. And that's true of everything that was in the town. Um, so before I get too much further either, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. I want to recognize the fact that we're here gathering today on, on traditional ancestral lands, of many prehistoric people, who some of whom are not even named, 
And then also certainly of modern times, we have the uh, Warm Springs Chiricahua Apache um, from up in Monticello way is their traditional lands, but they certainly came here. And also the Mescalero Apache from Mescalero, New Mexico, and also the Comanche um, from the plains, all traditionally and up until modern times came here. Actually, the Mescalero, there are photographs of the Mescalero Apache in the 1960s would come and in teepees, uh, which were not traditional to them, but they'd been adopted from the prairie, from the plains, came and actually set up in Ralph Edwards Park in their teepees to come and partake of the healing waters. Um, I have a friend of mine, a native woman, and I asked her at one point, um, this is actually a point relevant to the name changes, I said, do you have a special name for this place? And I thought maybe, you know, she would part, you know, give me some even more ancient name. She said, yeah, we do. Hot Springs. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's used time and time again. Um, I'm going to have some thank yous, too. So this is all kind of opening comments. Um, I want to thank the state park staff and Erica specifically, who's here tonight, to help uh, host us. Um, I want to thank DeRay Johannick who, as many of you may know, was the person who started this series of talks and lectures about four or five years ago. It's been incredibly successful. And I know she's not here in the audience tonight, but I want to thank her and all the hard work. She asked me to do this talk about a year ago. I think she was starting to scrape the barrel because she'd had all the other talks about the birds and the bees and, and you know, the amphibians and the geology. But and so she started to think about other things. So um, I want to thank her. I also want to thank, um, she's not a close friend, but I just want to give her credit, the, you know, the inimitable Sherry Fletcher, who is TRC's uh, uh, lifelong historian. And um, if, you ever want to, if you ever want to crash course in the history of TRC, get this book. These ones that are these, um, you can see it or not, you know, these uh, sepia colored books, they're, they're all over the West and stuff. This, she co-wrote this one with Cindy Carpenter. And as you can see, it's a favorite reference point. It's nice because it's a lot of pictures, okay? Not too many words. Um, but it, it's uh, amazing what is in that book. Um, I also want to thank uh, Delmas Howe for a lifelong inspiration of a resident here in town. He's one of the, one of the main reasons I'm here. And I think it's, he's also one of the main reasons Truth or Consequences has become known as a artist colony. I think it's really attributed, attributed to him. And I also want to thank the late Marilyn Pope who is the executive director of Geronimo Springs Museum, who is an inspiration to me and to many people around uh, research and history uh, of the county and the city, particularly in the genealogy of the families that have been here for some of which for several hundred years or many hundred years. And then finally, I wanna thank the board and staff, members of the Geronimo Springs Museum. I am on the board and I just wanna give a plug. We have our brand new 1923 calendar and I have about eight copies up here. 20, what, 1923? Uh, yes, uh, it does have pictures from 1923. Uh, 2020, <laughs> it's a collector's item. You know. uh, so I have some copies, they're $10 a piece. Uh, we're only into the new year by four days, so it's still very usable. And I noticed a couple of you were looking at them already, so your fingerprints are all over them, and so you've got to buy those copies. We have a couple sold, I guess, in uh, that regard. <clears throat> So um, we're going to spend a little time on the name change, and let's see if this all works. There we go. So in the beginning, uh, and this is really the beginning in terms of European influence on uh, truth or consequences, um, this is a, a photograph, so we're in the photographic era. I'm going to ramble a little bit about what fascinates me, one of the things about TRC, is... Um, Historians, those who are professional historians, uh, agree for some reason, or there are many reasons, but in, the end of the frontier was in 1890. And that was a point when all the uh, wars between uh, Native peoples and the American government had ended. It was also the year when the first statue of the Confederacy was put up in Richmond. It was Robert E. Lee. So that whole, you know, in modern times, we've been seeing all those coming down. But the first one was put up in 1890. Um, it was also the um, Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890. So it was a pivotal point. It was believed, it's thought in you know, hindsight by historians that it was the end of the frontier, the end of any time that was still to be explored by Europeans. Uh, and so what fascinates me about that point of history is Truth or Consequences wasn't founded as a town until a good 20 years after that in the teens, the 19 teens. So it has all the makings of frontier towns, 
but it was in a much more modern era. So my hope, and it seems to be proving true for me in the bit of research that I've been doing, is that there's a great deal of information about what a frontier town was like uh, and is documented because they had photography and they had a newspapers and they had printing presses uh, and there was a beginning of much more uh, communication from a small town like this to the rest of the world. So that in and of itself, I think is fascinating that we have all the makings of an American city. Uh, it was never a Spanish or a Mexican city. So it, it's one of the flavors of truth or consequences. And the other thing that interests me so much um, is how, well, I'll wait, I have a slide on it about its remoteness and what its uniqueness. So going back to the name change, this is something from probably about 1910 or whatever. They think that the first hot springs that were developed were by ranchers, uh, cowboys from a ranch called the Cross Ranch. I haven't had a chance to look up any much of the research, but that seems to be one of the first um, American influences of the area where these cowboys that would come and put up shade to come and take the waters. So one of the interesting things about from this period of the 19 teens to when the name changed was it went from something like this and something like this and something like this to in 35 years, it went to something like this. And I've got one more slide to like this. This is, um, this is up on Main Street. Some of you might recognize the building. This is the, the bank building, the National Bank founded by... Conrad Hilton's father. There's now a plaque on it by the current owner that highlights that information. But another interesting thing about this photograph, if you look, is probably from right here, all of those buildings are gone. They don't, they don't exist anymore. So um, I'm not sure if this was from a fiesta. I don't have a date on it or if it was actually. The rodeo was a very, very big deal for many years before, before Ralph Edwards and the fiesta. And so they actually at some point then integrated. Um, but the point being here, in just 35 years, this little town went from sticks and mud to mortar and glass and balconies and, and all that kind of thing. And so we'll talk more about that. Uh, this is a picture in one of those buildings that was just in that photograph. Now that I think about it, it's, uh, it's the first pharmacy. It was up on May. The building is still there. It is now uh, Sid Bryan's new gallery, uh, 405 or something. Uh, it's got the bricks painted and such. But anyway, these are some elders of town. And in the next slide, uh, there's some copy and their names are listed. And that's not so much important. But what I want to point out, this is taken when the city, the town was talking about whether to change its name or not. And so right up in here, here it is. All were said to favor the notorious move. So it was certainly notorious as the town, I guess, was in many ways. Um, not everybody was convinced, convinced it was a good idea, but it was already starting to bring in the publicity that the town needed to promote the area. Ralph Edwards, host of the radio show, guaranteed to promote the town to his coast-to-coast -to -coast audience. The town was listening. So you know how they talk about, for those of us who use these things in our pocket that are these little boxes with lights and you touch them all the time, how the, the internet companies are collecting our use of those, the data, our attention to those. My thesis here in TRC was it was all about attention, getting and giving attention. The town wanted attention, Ralph Edwards wanted attention, and he could give attention. So it was really about a dialogue or a, you know, you use me, I'll use you, uh, and let's see what we can do together. Um, it was all about done by this man. Now, if, uh, most of you probably know this, but I'll just say very, very briefly. Ralph Edwards was one of the founding fathers of American radio, particularly radio um, <clears throat> game shows. Uh, one of his most famous, This Is Your Life. The other one was called Truth or Consequences. Uh, there are a couple other the big titles. Um, and so he was already quite a figure. <laughs> and this is from the paper of the, for the first fiesta. And you can just see he, the, the city was smitten by him. You know, if, I mean, if you couldn't put an ad in the paper if you didn't have his photograph in it. There's another side of the page. It's just like, you know, and it's page after page. And so, um, you know, Ralph, we love you, but you love us back. Um, and so, um, and, you know, he was a very personable fellow. He, I remember the first, uh, well, in the first years, but uh, he was still coming. He came for 50 years, actually literally 50 years of the fiesta. 
Uh, I think the last one then would have been in 2001, and he was riding in a Cadillac. He would always have a convertible Cadillac. The last couple of years, they had two nurses, very pretty nurses, that would sit on both sides of him and help kind of prop him up because um, he really wanted to be here. And he, he, he fell in love, as many of us do, with this town. He was uh, loved by all. Here's the local sheriff and po uh, city police department uh, kind of hanging out with him in the middle. And then here's another picture from the time. There's the phrase, hello, we've been waiting for you. And as they point out in the copy here, it's actually who's saying that? You know, is the city saying it to Ralph or is Ralph saying it you know, to the city? And so again, it was this, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back and it'll give us what we want, which is uh, you know, commerce and publicity. One interesting thing about Truth or Consequences is through all its ups and downs um, is that it is thought, one of the, one of the urban myths or rumors about it, I, I kind of hope to, I believe it, is that for a town of its size, six to 7,000 people, it is the most documented, the most recorded, the most written about, the most videography about of any town of its size in the country. So over the years, the interest that it has garnered has really uh, paid off in, in, that, in that respect. So here is the Hot Springs Herald, uh, teeming with thousands today for Fiesta. And, and one of the things, I won't go into too many of them, but there are so many articles that just really spoke to me to today. Like one of the articles I saw was they were really worried about where they were going to house everybody. And I went to a lodger's tax meeting about a month ago, and there's a gem and mineral show coming in March, and they're expecting many, a couple thousand people. And it was one of the concerns. How are we going to house all these people? We don't have the capacity. Um, so they're, they're, again, these, these rhymes and re rhymes of history continue to, to uh, play out. Um, so again, the sheriff's posse rodeo to be biggest ever offered here. The, the posse sheriff, the rodeo was gone going and it just melded with uh, the fiesta. Um, the parade was three miles long, expected that day. Uh, and then this I'm gonna, is a, an enlargement of what was in the middle of that page. And I just wanna point out, there's a couple of things. Okay. Yeah, right up here, you see that? <laughs> That's at, at 9 a.m. on Friday, there's gonna be an elephant shoot. How, now, isn't that something we should bring back? You know? I don't think PETA would be very happy about it, but, uh, and where could you get an elephant? Um, but, so at 9 a.m., you had to, all contestants must pick up badges in Chamber of Commerce building to be eligible. And then, my, yeah, they had a real elephant. Yes, it was a real elephant in town. And then, and then here was an ad that week, are elephants really afraid of mice? So, you know, kind of playing on this whole idea of the, of the notoriety and the information stuff. It turns out what they were shooting was with cameras. Ah. So whoever could find the oh. hidden elephant, and I haven't seen in the literature where it was or who won, oh. or how they could develop your film that quickly back in the day to know if it was a really the, the elephant. But um, it, it's kind of a, the cuteness and quaintness of, of the day. Um, this is just a quick little side. Again, T or C had you know, bus lines, look at that, southbound four times a day, wow. northbound to Albuquerque four times a day, um, connections to any point in the United States. Um, there is, you know, there, the old Greyhound bus depot that's down at the very end of Broadway next to Rio Bravo, which, which is now the teen, teen center. That was a, a continental really at one point. Um, Okay, other, you know, and again, this is not professionally presented. It's just kind of things that interest me sometimes. So this next thing, here is a fella who got on a bus for a, a, for a ticket to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he ended up in Hot Springs, New Mexico. <laughs> um, so I'm sure he was welcomed with open arms and, and fell in love with the place, and people would say, have you bought a house yet? You know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, this one is a little controversial. I'm, I'm not wanting to besmirch anyone, but it's just a curious thing. Here was, there was a fella uh, whose name was A.J. Howell. He was exonerated for any responsibility in the death of a fella that had climbed up on the front of one of his buildings to change some canopy or to resurface it or whatever when the front of the building fell off and killed him. And um, this person, uh, Mr. Howell, was found exonerated because he didn't know anything was going on at the building. He supposedly didn't know anything about it. Um, you know, small town, yeah. you, know, you know who's doing what.
Um, I put this in there. We won't really look at it, but there's all these businesses. It's really fascinating because some of them have a real meaning. Um, the hot spring, well, a lot of hot springs things, but what was that? I was just looking at. Um, New York. Yeah, New York. Elephant Butte Lodge. Um, anyway, so it, again, this was one of the ads. Uh, this was actually, they brought in a bunch of newspaper people from the Southwest for a big, big um, convention at one point. Um, okay, so this next one is a little bit, of, um, again, is that legible to anybody? Yeah. Easier? Okay, I try to make it bold. Okay, what makes TRC unique? And these are my own uh, takes on it. Um, this is a photograph down, you know, as you can see, obviously past the temporary dam, looking back up at town, you can see the, uh, the steeple, the church right there. So, you know, Main Street and Broadway are running along like here. Um, so what I think is interesting, and this goes back to some of the things, things I was talking about when I said what fascinates me is that this was a frontier town that was founded 20 years after the frontier was closed, um, is that it was settled very late. Uh, 1890, end of the frontier, a late era frontier town. I think that it will prove to have all the components of a classic frontier town. Uh, and that includes the three economies, which we'll talk about again. And I'm just teasing anybody to be thinking about what those are. Um, it, as I said, it was never a Spanish or Mexican settlement. It was, a US, it was in the U.S. territory at the time uh, when it was settled. Uh, isolated, very remote. And I, one of the things I didn't get ready for this presentation, I really wanted to show a series of slides one that basically you can imagine in your in your minds one of the United States, and one that and point out where we are. Then one of the Southwest and point out where we are, and then point and then New Mexico and point out where we are, and then down to Sierra County. Because with all the modern conveniences, it's hard to to really grok the idea about how remote this place is. Um, there was not. I was told the other day by one of the amateur historians in town that they we didn't get. Uh, telephones till like 1958 or 59. There was not a highway north and south where the current interstate is until sometime in the late 30s. Um, how you used to get here, there were several ways, but the main one during more modern times when the city was being settled was there was a train line that's still out there. It goes from Albuquerque down through Berlin and to Engel and on to El Paso. You know, there's talk about that someday being an extension of the trail, the rail, rail runner from up north, because the train tracks are already there. But that's how, if you were in Albuquerque and wanted to get to, say, up to Hillsboro, you would get on that train, you'd get down all the way to Cutter, which is further than Engel, and you would come over uh, um, La Pol uh, Paloma, Paloma Gap, which is, was a, is an ancient, his, ancient trackways from the plains in the east to come over into the valleys of the Rio Grande and up into the Gila by ancient peoples. It was how the miners first came in with their pack animals and such. So if you were again on this train and coming down, it would take you maybe half a day to get down here, maybe not so long. And then you would get on a stagecoach and the stagecoach would take you over Paloma Gap, Paloma's Gap. And it would take you out to Nut, which is out south of the Gila really. And then at Nut, you would stay overnight and you would get on another carriage the next day that would take you across the mountain, the side of the mountain range to get up into the Hillsboro area. So it would take you a good day and a half to get from Albuquerque to Hillsboro. We do that now in three hours, even less. So it's just one of the things to, to realize the, how isolated we were. Another example of the isolation is Hornada del Muerto. That is the flat areas out here on the other side of the mountain range right immediately here that goes from uh, south of town about 20, 30 miles all the way up to roughly Socorro. And it was called the Hornada del Muerto, the journey of death, because there was no surface water that entire range and it took more than 24 hours. So you had to carry water if you're if your carriage broke down or your wagon broke down, you were dependent on others or, you know, you abandoned things and such like that. It was very uh, dangerous and you were, uh, you were a prey to marauding Indians. Um, but why would they do that? Partly it was shorter, but it was also easier. It was much flatter than if you tried to stay along the river through here. We all know up the ups and downs on the interstate uh, to get north and south. There's a lot, of, a lot of that that they would have to endure. So that was much easier. But I also, my own personal feeling about it is that because the hot springs were here and so many native peoples were coming and going from here, um, that it was just a place to avoid by the first the conquistadors and then later uh, the north and south traffic of the, of the Americans, the Mexicans and Americans. 
Um, again, some of the last fighting between Indians and settlers was in this region in the 1880s, um, up in the Apaches and the, the U.S. Cavalry and the Mexican uh, military. Um, I think another interesting thing about just this being remote is that Sierra County didn't exist when the counties were first created for a territory. There were about eight, eight or ten counties for the entire state of New Mexico at the time. So we weren't the only one that didn't exist initially. But it wasn't until 1884 that parts of Grant County, which is over Silver City, parts of Socorro County from Socorro, and parts of Doña Ana County from Las Cruces were all put together and created into Sierra County. And TRC really didn't, didn't exist yet. It was still remote and, and nothing beyond the hot springs was happening here. Um, and so it was not the original county seat. Um, the first county seat, because of the, the economic engine of the county was minerals and mining, and the seat, the first county seat was Hillsboro, um, which was one, they considered the first mining town. And interestingly enough, it was never a ghost town. It was never abandoned. So from its foundation, founding in the 19th century to today, it's been continually inhabited. But what happened, and we'll get a little ahead with this, but um, when economic factors changed, when mining played out and it just lost its, its strength, it was in the 1930s. And there was an effort initially to move the, the county seat to Cutter, again, further out on the rail line where there had been economic activity, but that was defeated um, by people in Hillsborough still. And then a few years later, there was the effort, and it was an effort that they couldn't resist county-wise to move the county seat to truth or consequences. And that's in the 30s, um, which had to do with uh, the economic development of tourism and the development of the hot springs. Um, the whole idea of traveling uh, coaches, cars, where people could start traveling, um, you know, the, the big east-west free highways were being completed. And so we were starting to get some business from tourism to the hot springs. Um, so we already talked about the travel by train and carriage until the 1930s. In the 30s, one of the how you would get to T or C was there were there were uh, I don't know what you call them coaches or cars that were services based in T or C that would drive back and forth over to Engel and bring you here into town because not everybody would have cars. It was the, it was the easiest way to get you back and forth. So that was basically you know the interstate didn't exist, the highway didn't exist. It was really oil oriented back over toward the, the valley over there. Um, the last grizzly bear in the lower 48 was killed in the Gila Mountains in the 1930s. So again, this whole aspect of how remote we are, there was minimal impact of civilization. And so the last grizzlies could really hold out here rather than any even Northern states um, in the country. I said there are no telephone until the 1950s. Uh, and still to this day, I-25 is the least traveled stretch of interstate in the country. You know, we are not a north-south country unless you're on one of the coasts, you know, and then there's all that north-south economic stretch. But in the middle of the country, they're not. It's We are all east-west. All the big freeways are east-west. So they did put it in. It was one of the last stretches that was ever completed uh, into like the 70s. I remember when I first came to the States in, in New Mexico in 82, there were some stretches between Albuquerque and Santa Fe that had not been completed, had not been paved into freeway status yet. So down here was even later. Um, and then the fact that the White Sands Missile Range and the spaceport are over there, that is all restricted space area. And the reason it is there is because it's very remote. There's no people, there's no big populations. Uh, if there should be a you know, knock on wood, an accident, minimal damage to populations. So again, this whole aspect that we are really remote, we are a little corner of the world that is off the beaten track. And then we're also unique because of the incredible hot springs, you know, world class and the high mineral content and the high volume of water. One in early days, I haven't heard it recently, but someone once said that there's more water coming up and through um, the hot springs that you don't necessarily see than in all of Yellowstone National Park. So there's a huge amount of water volume that comes up every day. OK, so it's, again, part of why I think this whole thing about it being a late frontier town uh, being very isolated, so you have the makings and the and the way people uh, developed uh, culturally and socially as a, as a town and then a city um, was dependent on this isolation. So uh, I've talked a couple times about the three economies. So and again, at the time, it would have been called Palomas Hot Springs, and we'll talk about the name changes in a in a couple minutes. Uh, the three economies were gambling, saloons, and bordellos. 
And again, I don't think TRC was unique or hot, Palomas Hot Springs at the time was unique to that phenomenon. I think that it um, probably occurred in all frontier towns and the in whole entire development of the frontier. You know, women had very few economic opportunities. Um, if you think about the mythological people that were in the frontier, they were trappers, they were frontiersmen, they were cowboys, they were miners. Those are all men in, in, by definition. So women came later and came in limited roles, uh, incredible hardships uh, if they came with a husband and family, obviously. Um, so, and again, uh, I, I may be speaking to the choir here, but I'll just say briefly, because I don't spend a lot of time talking about Elephant Butte or the dam up here. I've really focused on the town and the wider county aspects. But um, the dam was started in 1912 and was finished in 1916. It said that there were about 6,000 young men who were the working force here. It was, it was federal property, so they couldn't gamble and they couldn't have liquor. And so what do you know, 6,000 young men do when they get paid on Friday or their, their Friday and they want to you know, be young men? They would go down to the hot springs. And so it's really what economic, the economic driver of what created Truth or Con hot, Paloma's Hot Springs um, and was the driver for many, many years. In some ways, if you look at get inside of some of the older buildings that still exist, you can see there was a lot of money here at one point. And again, that image that I showed you of those, those dirt shacks and adobe structures, very dispersed and really ramshackle, that within just 35 years, you know, a little over a single generation, you had the development, you had uh, electricity coming in, you had the uh, banking system, you had the property was were deeded all that kind of stuff. So it was a very, very rapid development. And that had to do with it. It had a very strong, robust economy. It is said that any two-story building in Truth or Consequences, at least in the downtown dis district, certainly probably universally of anyone that still stands, was a building that had prostitution in it. Um, the second floors were, if you, uh, this is a, one of my favorite building blocks in town. Um, it, I think, retains a lot of the integrity. There are about two or three sections of downtown that have as much integrity as this. Um, I've got another picture of the two. I just want you to look up the side. Uh, this is Mims, and there's a really sweet couple of little buildings back there, a little bit more shacky, probably older. You can see this brick, the couple of brick buildings in front were more modern. And one of the interesting things, if you look on the front of the corner building on the second floor, there's a door. And again, that's very common. You'll see that if you start looking at buildings, two-story buildings in town, most of them have a, front, a door on the front side. They all had porches at one point, for one for the fresh air, for the breeze, um, and probably for you know, women out there seeing who's in town. Um, and then also that building, if you, if you go up in on that second floor, you can see it's all one big space now, but at one point you can see where it was divided up with wall, where the walls left marks in the flooring um, of where they were small little individual rooms. So this is the front of those two buildings. Um, I would just encourage people to, the, you know, the what's inside the window, there's an incredible collection of, of, of cultural artifacts and stuff in the, in the windows of this bottom building. Um, I don't have permission to say his name, the owner, but he's a dear friend. And um, like, I, I used to say he was born and raised here. He corrected me a couple of years ago. He wasn't born here. He was born in Corona, New Mexico. Um, but he grew up here. And I know a couple of you know this, know this wonderful man, a great contributor to city, the city culture and such. <clears throat> so here's another example, an older photograph. Shows you the two stories, shows you the front porch aspect of it. Uh, and again, truth or consequences, I don't go much into this either, but about the fact that it became famous for the, you know, the West became famous for its clean, fresh mountain air uh, for tuber tuberculosis student or students of patients and things. And so the, the idea of being out at night and being able to get fresh air, also dealing with the heat um, to be outside, sem semi outside, was very common and very desired. Okay, so this is um, the building that was the original, the first pharmacy. I showed you a photograph of that group that was sitting in the pharmacy talking about the notorious chain name and change. It was in this building. Um, and again, I pointed out, it was an earlier photograph. Everything from here now is empty parking lots all the way over to Susie Bueller's property, which was uh, is considered the core of that building is one of the oldest buildings still re remaining in town. 
can't see it from the exterior really, but in terms of a, the core of it. The other thing I want to just point out is this, see this little outline right here? Okay, we're a little pointer. So there's this little line right here. And in the next slide, we'll see better shot of it. That actually um, is a door that goes downstairs into a cellar to a speakeasy. So oftentimes, so you had the women in the second floor and you had the, spe the, you know, the speakeasies, the, the bar king gambling parlors and such in the basements. Um, <clears throat> and there were, just a quick side, there were two different families. One family controlled the gambling and the other controlled the liquor businesses. And so they were, they were not friends, should we say, in terms of families. But the, so the, the people that ran, the, ran the, the, the shots were two different families. Um, you can get into the speakeasy now. When Sid bought the second building with the bright colors on it, he opened up a doorway that was there between the two, <clears throat> and there's a stairway from there that goes down into the speakeasy. So one of the things I've wanted to think about doing would be to get some kind of a tour, a day tour, where people would open up places like that, and you get to see some of these that are off limits just to the general populace. And to really kind of dive deep into what remains, because there's so much. And that's another aspect that I love to talk about is, uh, you know, Truth of Consequences has, has had hard times a, a good bit of its life. Um, and I feel for people that ha have grown up here and have felt they've had to leave for opportunities and such. Um, and But one of the pluses of that is that so much has remained and has not been destroyed or taken away. So one of my favorite things is architecture, and there's so much of the stories that are revealed in the architecture of town. And I started doing this with walking tours about four or five years ago, uh, historical walking tours of downtown. And it's just, it's amazing to see how much you can kind of look at and, and see and tell the stories just based on the architecture that's still there. Um, this next one, we're going back a little bit. Susie Bueller's house is a little past this to your right. And she had this beautiful um, painting, uh, done by Reed Ritchie. We'll see a couple other pieces of his work, a wonderful mur muralist in town. And this is a replica of the big sign that was out on the front of the Buckhorn. Buckhorn was a famous, famous, notorious bar that was in this very site. You can see the different layers. And <clears throat> Michael and I got a chance to actually, before the building was destroyed, was torn down by the city, um, got a chance to get into it and look at it. And it too in the back and the upper levels had small little adobe rooms that were rented out for short-term rentals, <laughs> is, is one way to put it. And the other thing about this bar is said, and I don't know if it was this little elevated area right here that she's painted the design, or if it was something in the back there, but there was a separate room at the very back of the bar that had a little peephole window that you could open up, and the sight line from that little window in the back of the bar went directly to the front door, so the gamblers would be in this little room and they'd have somebody watching the front door. And if the sheriff or somebody like that, the state police should come in, everybody ran out the back door and up the hill and got away. So this, this bar had lots of stories. Here's an interior picture of it. And it's a Tafoya. I don't know if it's the, there are two family names, famous family names from Monticello, which is another fascinating small town in the county and was very seminal in the history of the county uh, in settlement. And there are two families, the Sullivans and the Tafoyas. And there's a wonderful book, if people are really interested. It, they have it at the Geronimo Springs Museum. It's called A New Mexican Family, Tafoya Sullivan, and the Origins of Sierra County. It's a wonderful book written by a Sullivan, um, not too long in the 90s, I think. So that was a great resource for, for the early development of the county, which I, I don't go into too much here. Okay, so here's a little bit about the name changes. So what's in a name? The first recorded name that we have was Ojo, de los, Ojo Caliente de los Palomas, Hot Springs of the Doves. And I kind of really love this name. I'm not saying to go back to it or anything, but I, you know, the aspect that the Hot Springs had lots of doves here, and we have two now. There's the, the Mexican doves are coming back from the south. I think uh, climate change is bringing them north. So we have three species of doves, the ringneck, the white winged dove, and now the Mexican dove, which is smaller and very pretty and quaint. So someone noticed that there were lots of doves here, and so it was called Ojo Caliente de las Palomas. Its name got changed to Palomas Hot Springs. There was a village called Palomas also that was down toward the Caballo Reservoir, 
There's Palomas is a drainage that comes out of the Gila and this is settled uh, to this day. And it's now the site is under Caballo Reservoir, but there is a village called Palomas. And it was wiped out by a flood coming out of the Gila sometime in, I think, the late uh, 19th century, so maybe the early 20th century, 20th century. And so the, the survivors of that basically picked up and moved up to Ojo Caliente de los Palomas, and it became starting to call it Palomas Hot Springs. So that's how the name shifted there. Then an early um, advocate of the town, an early immigrant uh, from Europe to the town was a man named Otto Goetz. He was an early commissioner, city commissioner, and an early mayor. And um, he started saying, let's just drop the Palomas and let's just go to Hot Springs. So he was the one who came along and had, had that name change. And then we've talked some and we'll talk more about the fourth name, the third change, truth the consequences. Um, I have some ideas. You know, I know that there's somebody out there on Facebook who's saying we need to change the name back to Hot Springs and stuff. Well, I'd say, well, yeah, and then become one of 45 other Hot Springs in the United States. That doesn't make us distinguished, but it's anyway, I won't go into more debates about it. But um, <laughs> so uh, so what's in the name? Now, this is coming in. We're going to start moving into if I'm right about my slides into the the 30s. Motor Court era, the WPA, the CCC, which I'll explain in a minute. But here's a thing I thought was interesting. These are two, I'll show you two postcards um, of these very classic, uh, how they're the imagery. You've got Elephant Butte up on the top, and the, there's the um, Carrie Tingley Hospital for Crippled Children. It's right here. It's kind of hard to make out much of any others. But anyways, and, and there's, there's the dam itself. Um, and then this next one is fairly similar. Um, again, it's still greetings from Hot Springs, New Mexico. And I just take in the, you know, this is all the cowboys and the cowgirl and all that kind of stuff. And again, the dam, the elephant butte is there a little bit. And I think what's interesting is this next slide, oh, you know, the name change and look at the imagery, how it's changed. Yeah. Um, you know, it's much more prim and proper and, you know, we've got something to sell to you, home of Elephant Butte Dam and Lake. It's now starting to play off of, um, you know, the, the economic generator of the Elephant Butte. Um, that was just kind of interesting as a little quick aside. So um, besides the building of the dam and the three economies, I think the next economic uh, real trend or the real event that happened in Truth or Consequences, again, it was Hot Springs then, was the Depression, the WPA, and the CCC. WPA stood for Works Progress Administration. It was one of the programs in the New Deal. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. The CCC was the Civilian Conservation Corps, another New Deal uh, program to put young men to work. Um, and New Mexico, uh, cap per capita, was a huge recipient for dollars for these programs. Uh, uh, if you go into all our state parks and national parks and you know, towns and villages and cap the capital and everything, there's incredible WPA and CCC projects. Then tr Sierra County also received an incredible amount of money in these programs for the size of its town. So we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about that. Um, the CCC, it is said that when young men would come into town and sign up for it, the person signing them up would also have them sign up for the Democratic Party which is illegal now. But in the early day, uh, Sierra County was considered a very democratic county. And that's a whole other story about how that has shifted over the years. Um, I'm just, I, we will look at some visual image of all these, but I just wanted to give them listed so you have a, a couple of ways of taking in this information. So buildings and projects of note in the, in the county and, and specifically TRC. The second elementary school on North Date. And again, we'll look at pictures of these. This is the corner of that building on North Date that you're seeing with the 1937 WPA. Uh, the post office on Main Street, I spent a good bit of time in that. It's an incredible, incredible building. Uh, street paving and flood remediation. There's little remnants of that all over downtown still. The Sierra County Courthouse on North Date and 3rd was a WPA project. Uh, the second town hall on what is now the Recreation Center on Foch, it's where the spaceport is. That's a WPA building. Um, the Kerry Tingley Hospital for Crippled Children is now the VA hospital. Uh, again, a very seminal piece of work. And then the CCC camps and projects throughout the county. So there were, I don't know the number, but there were several. There was one out here, here at the dam site. 
There was one I found I, on a bike ride many years ago. I just happened to find it and then tracked it down. It's an abandoned site out of the Monticello Flats. If you're going to Monticello and take a um, to the left and cut across on dirt roads, you can find uh, it's really fascinating because there was a fountain that these young men built. They must have it's near a it's near a dry arroyo, so they must have drilled and gotten some water. But they built a lovely little fountain, and in the concrete bed of the fountain, you can see some names that were scr scratched into the soft the, the wet concrete. So it's got some really neat stuff. Um, so we're now going to spend a little time on some of these different projects. This is an old timey picture of the elementary school on North Date, and you'll get to recognize it in a few minutes. But I'm going to jump ahead. This is the post office down on Main Street. And when they were digging, and on my walking tour, we walk right by this and we talk about the fact that the old uh, riverbed came basically through and right before the, where the, where the um, post office is, it would veer and go across through downtown and back into the river. That all got redrouted and drained in the, in the 20s and 30s. Um, but when they dug the foundation for this building, in the depression, this is what they found. With it below, just about three or four feet below ground level, was is all, all downtown has got water and hot springs, and so they had to develop a technique that is basically a concrete hull. It's a it's floating in in its structure, and so it's floating on top of this water. Um, again, that would be one of the places, the one of the buildings I'd love to have open up be able to go into the basement. It used to be a fallout shelter. You can see on the front of the building, there's an old faded radiation symbol for a fallout shelter. And in the back is fascinating. Um, one day, one of the people at the front counter actually did take me in and show me a couple of little side rooms and stuff. And a quick fun story is the uh, postmaster had an office that was up kind of in the second floor part of it. And he had a one-way mirror that he could look down onto the work area and he could spy on everybody and just, you know, just find out what was going on in the front of the customers and stuff to keep track of everyone. Um, so another take on the building, the post office there. Uh, all of those buildings that you see going up the street are still intact and still here today. And these are modern photographs of the, of the building. Um, it didn't occur to me until I'd been looking at the building several times and talking about it, that if you notice this line right here, and it's, it's long under here, that is a completely new facade that was put on the building when the ch name change happened. So underneath it, it says Hot Springs in the 87901, or probably they didn't even have a zip code then, actually, so there wouldn't have been a zip code. So that got added. Um, so that's kind of a funny little thing that, that uh, just a note about the, the building. Um, the architectural style was used by lots of buildings uh, during this period. Federal buildings were built. It's got a weird kind of quirky name. It's, it's, if you look straight on it, it's very classical. It's very balanced. It's very symmetrical. But it has very little ornamentation. And so it's called Starved Classic. <laughs> and you know, I, guess, I guess that's an appropriate uh, Depression era name. Um, and uh, I'm going to go back and just show you these. So the images we're gonna be looking at are like right here, they're ornamentation that are right here. And again, this is um, in the mid to late 30s. So the United States was trying to come out of the depression, uh, not doing so well, but you know, populating, uh, feeding lots of people with federal programs. But they were wanting to really take note of the economic prowess that the United States was developing and which would be obviously exemplified in the World War II. So the three images are all of commerce and transportation. That's real faded, but it's the front end of a big steamship or ship. So those are details there to kind of look at sometime inside. So is there anybody, I won't make you stand, put your hand up if you haven't been in, but if you've not been in the lobby or if you haven't gone in recently, I would really encourage you to go. Um, it's almost all original. This little, uh, lo uh, I don't know if, the, if the, this windbreak lobby is maybe not, but it was added at some point. But all that lovely, lovely woodwork. Um, another thing I'll show that, you know, they really were doing some business in the day because there's two windows here that they would wait on people. And, you know, now we have about a half of a window because they're only open half a day. Um, so there's just not the same amount of business. Um, but here is, that's the postmaster's office. And then I want to talk about this painting that's up here. 
part of the WPA program was to putting artists to work. And so there were specific programs for creating cultural value, um, paintings, uh, music, recording and saving music, um, many things like that. And New Mexico has an incredible amount of these kinds of cultural artifacts from the period. This painting was painted by a, a, a German immigrant. His last name is Deutsch, which is German. I forget his first name, but um, there was a contest for all these paintings that were done in the federal buildings throughout the state, and this was the winner. So we have the number one piece of painted art from the WPA program in New Mexico. Um, and I also want to say, I was up in Santa Fe over the Christmas holiday, and I was reading the, the reporter up there, Santa Fe reporter, had a paper, 25 things we love about Santa Fe right now. So I thought, well, that'd, that'd be interesting. And I read it, and it was a great slice of life in Santa Fe and, and how it's growing and the breweries and all that kind of stuff and becoming a city uh, with a lot more young people, I would say. But one of the things they featured was the Supreme Court building up there. And I didn't know this. I've never gone in it, but it said it was a WPA building. And in the little write-up, it said it is the only WPA building in New Mexico that was built for its purpose and still remains with the same purpose. We know better. We have three, three buildings in New Mexico, in, in TRC, that were built and are still used for the purpose that they were built for. So when I want to, when I get around to it, I want to write him a letter and, and tell him, hey, you know, you shouldn't have said, you know, the only one throughout New Mexico or something. Um, so I've got a couple more photographs, some close-ups. Uh, again, sorry about the reflection. The thing I like to point out about this one is in the original painting, this area with the mountains, he painted a train coming head on, at, you know, out into, out into the viewer and into this group of Native American people. Someone was kind of pointing out to him that that probably didn't look very good. And so he was asked to repaint it. And so he put in these mountains. It's not historically accurate. The closest you could maybe see is this very tall figure um, is a shalico, a, a sort of a shalico from Zuni Pueblo. They have a midwinter um, ceremony. Shalicos come in and they're very, very tall. They're so tall they come to bless houses and you have to dig a trench in the middle of your living room to let them come in so they can dance. Um, and they've basically been closed to outsiders now for quite a few years, but that's the closest to really identifiable character here or person. Um, just another close-up on it. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece. So this is one of the windows, again, showing just some of the detail as num number one of the number two. Um, you know, old brass boxes, you know, there's beautiful to go. And they, they probably were little combinations originally, but they've been retrofitted into keys. Yeah. So another impact uh, was the downtown. This is a curb. FERA, F-E-R-A was Federal Emergency Relief Administration. It was an early um, uh, New Deal program. I think it got contested and so it was closed down and then other things came about, the, the WPA and the CCC. But this one, 1935, I did today, I was just walking through part of downtown and I found one was 1934. So that would have been the earliest that I've seen. They go up to 1941 when these sidewalks and curbs were built and gutters. Um, there's a few here, WPA 1940. This has got, it was spray painted yellow for the curbing. There's an interesting one. There's, they did it twice in this corner. And unfortunately, this, this, this is a, a, a give kudos to Linda, who's here. This was with a project of Main Street, um, where they have replaced some of the sidewalks downtown. And they had this impression put into the, these new pieces. This is about the best one that I could see. I didn't have the time to kind of, maybe if you swept it out, you might get more relief. But they weren't near as deep in relief as the WPA ones. Um, but this was funding that was done through Main Street to rebuild some of our sidewalks in downtown. Um, so this is going back to the elementary school. And I went to take pictures of it the other day and realized that it uh, is always talked about. Here's a modern photograph of it uh, as it being a WPA building. But actually, if you get close and look at it, and I'm just gonna, again, I'll point out, it has two wings to it. This one right here and the other one that's not visible is over here. Those are the WPA add-ons. The building itself, public school 1923. So the middle section was built in 1923. It was the second elementary school. The first one was a tent 
that was done a little bit off of Main Street up in the foothills above, kind of up behind the, po the not the post office, but the museum or Susie Bueller's property. Somewhere it was up off out of the flood zone uh, and it was a tent where kids would come, any kids that were in town at that point. So this is the first actually site built school. So this is the other wing. And again, I did this, I, that was the image I pulled off for the beginning of this part of it. These murals were done in 1997 by the Sierra County Arts Council. And Delmas Howe was pivotal in that. Uh, Rebecca, I saw you come in, were you? Uh, yeah. It was the first project of the Arts Council. Uh-huh, okay, great. And I think Delmas had some help with the design. Is that right? Do you know Rebecca? Um, it was, no, I think Anthony Bennett, who had the idea that okay. involved. Is he the fellow that did the water towers? Yeah. Yeah. So as you may know, we've got the water towers painted here, and there's some in, in Las Cruces. So that artist who did that work was also involved in doing these murals. They also had a lot of kids uh, from the town participate in doing these. And they're just they're beautiful, beautiful pieces. Close up. This is at the other end. And one of my favorite things, you know, the turtle motif shows up everywhere here. And I see it, the more and more I look around town, you see the turtle. And again, there's the WPA symbol right there. So this is the plaque created by the Children of Sierra County, sponsored by the Sierra County Arts Council, funded by the New Mexico Arts Division and local businesses. It's a celebration of Sierra County. There's two murals. So the Sierra County Courthouse, also WPA, 1939. Um, this is the front of it. I didn't. I have never been in the building, and I think that's maybe a good thing. Um, so I don't have any inside photographs. It's, it needs some loving care. The paint on it is peeling. They don't use these the front entrance anymore. They're they're fire exits. You have to go around to the back where there's some modern add-ons. So I don't have much there on it. So this is another one of the really, really important WPA buildings that was built. Um, does anyone recognize this? Okay, yep. Yes, it's now the Lee Bell Johnson uh, Center. It was originally the second town hall. Uh, again, it's a beautiful building to go in with the original woodwork that's inside, the feeling of it. It is done in what is called a Pueblo Revival style which was the style that came out of Santa Fe. When Santa Fe was rebranding itself in the 20s and 30s, um, they were falling in economic uh, behind Albuquerque because the trains and the highways had come through and, and, econ and the economic engine of the state had become Albuquerque and not Santa Fe. The train didn't go, there was a spur that went up into Santa Fe, but some of the elders in Santa Fe said, we need to really start promoting ourselves. So they came up, talked to architects and came up with what's called now the Pueblo style. This is called the Pueblo Revival or Pueblo Revival style. We have a lot of revival uh, architecture uh, going back to um, the Sierra County, this building. This is a territorial revival, and I won't go into details, but the little brick at the top is a classic indicator of territorial style. And this is a revival of that. This is a revival of the Pueblo style. Uh, another picture kind of of the same, a little bit later era. I wanted, I'm gonna go back a second. I wanted to talk about up here, is you can barely make it out, it says Vera Hotel. It's two story. Um, this was actually, when it was originally built, it was at, at, at the dam site out here. It was barracks and a cantina for some of the workers. And it was just completely, dis when, the, when the dam was done, there was a lot of construction infrastructure that was at the dam site that was no longer needed. This was completely disassembled and floated down the river and, and brought and reassembled here. If you look at modern pictures, I don't have one of it, but this top story is gone. It's just a single story now. It's owned by the Sierra Grande um, Hotel. They have bought it. There's some convention rooms, things like that. I think there's some rooms to stay in up there, but it just showed up in this other photograph. Um, and you can see it's still over there. It's not quite as obvious. And now you can see this is rebranded. It's no longer the city town hall. This is a re recreation center. And here's a modern day photograph of it, the Lee Bell Johnson building. Uh, and it houses, uh, there's the name, it houses the visitor center, the Geronimo Trails Scenic Byway uh, Information Center. Also has the Spaceport Visitor Center. Um, there's been a lot of controversy in the last 10, 15 years 
So it's been controversial. I, I won't go into that. But um, I hope that the city will take it back and make it a community center again. I was all in favor of the spaceport having an office there, thinking it would bring in tourism. Uh, the center, the, the, the Geronimo Springs Byway Tourist Information Center, the two top reasons, and they asked people who signed in why they came, the top reason now has become the spaceport. And the second one is the hot springs. So um, it's hard to say there's much economic benefit from um, the spaceport, but it, it hopefully is coming. But I would like us to take the space back. We need a better performance space uh, for live performance and, and kinds of things. So, um, so this I stuck in here is my little pause to tell you that when I was making the PowerPoint presentation, uh, if you're on the internet, it will go to the internet and will bring back and give you suggestions for slides. You know, so I typed in, you know, Hot Springs City of Health, and this is what it gave me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, I've got to leave that. Especially when you look at this old, and this is a very classic, this next photograph, very classic photograph. <laughs> so, you know, how far removed are we? Um, so, uh, and again, this is kind of how much water they're in and how much mud, I'm not sure. But, you know, if it's hot, it's going to be beneficial. So coming out of the WPA and the, the Depression era, I was talking about the, inf the, in the, the, in the growth in the tourism industry. And so it was one of the ways that the town started promoting itself and doing flyers like this, an invitation to a spa from the businessmen of Hot Springs, New Mexico. But if you look at the finer print, being an appeal to conservative, thoughtful people. That's who we want to have come here. And situ situated in the high, dry altitude of the Rockies on the scenic Rio Grande. Um, this is a sign that is still up to this day. And I'm not trying to go after anybody particularly. I, I know when I first kind of came through TRC, in my later days, in the early 90s, this was what most of the signage for the hot springs kind of looked like. Yeah. You know, they were, you couldn't find them. They were very hard and difficult. And there'd been such an economic hardship here for so long that uh, there just wasn't the money to, you know, paint, keeping a paint fresh and signed and keep it open and such. Um, but this one's still up there. So I, I was really happy to get a sign for it. Um, and now we're going to go back and talk a little bit about the, the soaking itself. This, there's going to be two slides here. This is what was originally called Government Springs. It was, again, thought to be the Cross Ranchers, where they first uh, came, the cowboys, and set up and soaking. And then it was it, all the property, all this property down here was basically owned by the federal government. And they did start deeding the property in the teens, uh, which became controversial because it was supposed to be those who were squatters or settlers on the land were supposed to have first rights for buying it when they were deeding it. And that's not what started happening. And so they put a halt to it and they went back and had went to the all the way up to the president, Grover Cleveland, who again signed something that decreed that those who were currently settling had the first rights of purchase for properties. Um, so again, this being was one of the first that the government had and, and made into hot springs. This is another picture of it. This, I believe it was this structure, or a structure very similar to this, was over these hot springs. This is on Main Street. This is right next to. Uh, Geronimo Springs Museum, and it now has that very colorful, and we have some shots of that later, colorful ceramic tile plaza. But there was a structure like this, and it was considered mostly for drinking. It wasn't made into soaking anymore by this point. Um, but at some point, that someone changed the name to Geronimo Springs. You know, it's still Government Springs here on the, on, the, on the white on the bottom at that point. Okay, Geronimo Springs. I'm not going to spend much time on this. We've already talked about it some. Uh, it was, it, we're having our 50th anniversary this year. It was founded by city fathers and mothers. It is a world-class facility. So if you uh, have not been in it, please take the time and go. It's um, quite remarkable. World-class collection of projectile points, uh, arrowheads and spearheads, world collection pottery, and we now have this incredible collection of gem minerals from on long-term loan from the Mineral Museum in uh, Socorro. Uh, notable women of the past century, three that people should know about. One is Sadie Orchard. First, uh, in terms of chronological order, she was a business lady of Hillsborough, Kingston, and Hot Springs. Business lady in quotes. She was very successful. She had a hotel. She did have a bordello. And she also uh, 
ran one of the carriages that would take people up into the mining towns and stuff at one point. And um, she talks about how she was attacked by Indians one time. She got off the, st off the coach, got her horse whip out and started whipping at them. And they took off and they would never bother her again when she was on the carriage. This is what is said. Uh, Magnolia Ellis, a more modern times, was considered quite a hands-on healer, drew a lot of people to this state. Um, and then Lee Bell Johnson, I have pictures of each, so we'll do a little. So one of the stories about a city orchard who is buried here in TRC at the main city cemetery. Um, and there's been talk about doing some kind of honoring or festival around her. Uh, there is a, a legend that she rode through town, Hillsboro, naked, like a Lady Godiva. This is a modern rendition of it. So this is another later version of her doing her Lady Godiva. I don't have, there are, there are photographs of her, but they're not really good quality. And so I, these were the better images to talk about her. Was Mag that advertising thing? Yeah. What's that? Was that advertising? Business? This here? Oh, you mean why she did it? Yeah. I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There was a paper up there. So if there are copies preserved of that paper, you can probably find out. Yeah. The question was, was it to do, was it, to, well, it was to promote herself. Yeah. Was, you know, certainly. Um, and then this is a kind of misnomer. It's called Ghost, Ghosts of Kingston Hillsboro. And again, I point out Hillsboro was never a ghost town. It was never abandoned. Um, so now back down in Broadway, the Magnolia Ellis building. This was built by Magnolia Ellis. Again, very successful businesswoman. It was said that she would see over 100 people a day. She had a 21-day treatment uh, of seeing you repeatedly, and then you would go and soak as part of the treatments. So this brought a lot of people. Uh, close up of that. And just again, recently the building was has new owners, I believe, and it was painted. Uh, and they have the sign in the window honoring her. Ellis Wellness and Healing Center is what it's called. This is a photograph of her. She was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and brought notoriety to the Roosevelt administration uh, with her relationship. And it was part of getting their attention of building the Carrie Tingley um, Hospital. It's another photograph of her. Uh, the other person was Lee Bell Johnson who died in 2011. She was 99 years old. Uh, she was the first female magistrate judge of uh, Sierra County. And she was a poet and has two books of poetry. Uh, she won prizes at po uh, Cowboy Poetry Contests. Also, she would go to, in her later years, a senior Olympics and read her poetry. And she won prizes for doing that. Um, somewhat controversial. I won't go into that necessarily. But um, yeah, this is the photograph that cover was based on. Yeah, the, um, any of you who know Julie Durham, she has a small video that she did of Lee Bell when she was still living, when she did some of her poetry, and it's quite remarkable. She had an incredible accent and, and personality in, uh, her, in her poetry. She was really about trying to save and tell the stories that she had experienced as a young girl of the, of the last of the West, uh, the cowboy mystique and you know, scrapping and getting by and having Indian friends. She was part, I think, a quarter, maybe a half Cherokee herself. Her father was um, half Cherokee, lived in the Cherokee uh, nation for a while as a child. It's another photograph of her. And this is her other book of poetry. So one other, and I'll be real quick about this. One of the other things I love about the shacks, we talked about the Vera Hotel being brought down from the, um, the dam site. Again, an urban legend was that these shacks were taken from the dam site where they were housing for young men, and they were loaded onto barges and when, when were boated down the river. It's, thought, it's a, thought to be an urban legend. They probably got confused with the Vera um, Hotel story, which was disassembled and brought down on barges. But it's thought that they were probably just put on big flatbeds, and it's only like four or five miles. And the effort to put it on a, a little boat and get it down and then unload it and all that kind of stuff doesn't make sense. But if you start looking around town, these are everywhere. And there's two things about it. They were the ones that were built specific to the dam site. And then also during that period, Sears and Roebuck um, had a version that you could order and would come you know, in parts and then you would build your own little shack. So I haven't been able to distinguish which is the true ones from the dam site and which were maybe these Sears and Roebuck. But some of them have been salvaged. The one on the right is one of my favorite, I mean, left, sorry, this one. It is out right off the interstate. If you pass uh, McDonald's and get on the interstate and heading north, on the Cachillo drainage, which is the first thing, if you look down, there's some buildings. This one is down there. And I hope, uh, it looks like it's got a more modern roof. I hope someone will do something to save it. 
Here's another one. Um, this is very close to Randy's um, alley. Uh, beautiful. It's, it's been incorporated. I got another close up of it a little bit. Uh, the wall has been incorporated into this uh, fascia of stone. And the, see the little ventilation? Very important. That's a signif signif significant indication of these cabins, also, if you look for that. The other thing, I've, I've got the Turtle Mountain in a lot of these because I just, it's such a presence over you know, when you're taking pictures of town. Uh, shows up all over. Here's another one. This is the backside of La Paloma um, Hot Springs. And you can see they put them together. And this probably was done as a motor court era because look at the large spacing between the pitched roofs. That was probably for an automobile to pull in. And that was part of the allure of the uh, motor court era is you could pull in your car into a little garage, have it out of the weather, and go right into your little room when you're traveling. And then this one is another version of that. And this is on Foch, close to Rotary Park. And this, these have really been preserved. They've got brand new modern roofs on them, have been restuccoed. Um, I'd love to do a whole project just on documenting. And, uh, and then some people are living in them, and these are, and then uh, have done really wonderful things to modernize them and make them these great spaces. Kind of the original tiny house. Yeah. yeah. Why the city won't let us have tiny houses again, I don't know. Very quickly, in 1970 efforts, this is again for the town trying to get attention. Um, it went ahead and several buildings, there's a few left, have this Old West facade that was put on the front of the buildings. Yeah. Up until about a year ago, the, this bluish building also had the same similar facade. They both had a matching uh, facades on them. This has now been taken off and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, it was done to give the city an allure of being like old, like Tombstone, Arizona an old west town where you'd have shoot em, shootouts and you know all the old myths of cowboys and frontier would come back to life. Um, it wasn't real successful, I guess. I don't know. There's uh, Again, it's something that I'm concerned about losing. Here's another building on Foch right off of Maine. Um, another interesting, the little bit I know about it, that it uh, has it had gambling in the basement. You can see there's a little, again, one of these basement doors right here. It goes downstairs. It has a hot springs in the basement, um, and it was supposed to. Have, it was supposed to be a, a gambling hall. And the story it has, and I, a, a local, another amateur historian has been down there to see it. There was a table that had a small safe underneath the table, so they could gamble. And in the safe was a person who, when you're making your bets, they would go in, and that person in that locked safe under the table would collect the money. So nobody could kind of like grab it and run off or whatever. So. It's quite a story. I don't think I'd want to climb in it, you know, and hope they're going to take me out. So these are from the plaza. I'm going to skip again some more. Um, the plaza that's down next to Geronimo Springs Museum. These are plaques that people gave money to that museum. Ralph Edwards, uh, Delmas Howe, and Fred B. Homeless, who was a real person here. I don't think that was his real name. He, the story was he gave that name so his wife couldn't track him down. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, very quickly, one of the architectural things I love about the town is this phenomenon of arches. Yeah. Can anybody guess? Um, I'll show one more picture. Here's another view of it. This is the phone company in downtown on Foch. And again, there's the mountain prominent above everything we do. So here's a Drama Springs Museum. All of these were done by a fellow named John Guthrie, who is a contractor. He was also a city commissioner at one point, and he loved the arch, and so he incorporated if you ever look at Drummond Springs, it's actually four buildings, but they all have had got one facade put over the front of them to combine them. The, the arch on the right-hand side is the part of that building was the original town hall. It was, it was owned by um, Otto Goetz, we talked about earlier. So that was the first uh, official town hall. Another place where the arches show up is this is one of the city administration buildings downtown. There's arches, uh, Los Arcos. And modern photograph of that. And I meant to get a photograph of you go inside, you're actually, you walk under arches too from room to room. So we got the motif going there. And there is one other building, the Ace Lodge, which is right next to Los Arcos, sort of. It has also the arch motif. So this is going to be kind of my wrapping up thing. The future is coming to TRC. These two photographs, maybe anybody been up on the north end of date, seeing what's now un unfurling before our very eyes is going to be the development of the three roundabouts. And so this is the equipment that's right across the street from the McDonald's, where they've caged off an area for equipment and culverts and things. And so uh, 
the future is coming. Actually, I had another slide that said the future is now because this is in downtown, again, a historical district. Um, the 25 years I've been coming, this is the first time there have been brand new houses being built in downtown. This is on the corner of Wyona and Mar, I think, or Post maybe. And um, these are over closer to the river, two-story. I love these because they're kind of idiosyncratic. They're not, uh, you know. Um, one of the one on the left is for sale. This is diagonal across from them. Another one is inhabited. So it's it's this is really kind of pivoting to you know the future and what's what's happening. We have a brand new dollar general store, um, and then over across from it, you can see from the photograph is the Carrie Tingley uh, Hospital for crippled children. Now the VA hospital. I went up there, and again the prominence of the hill, of the mountain right across from it. They're, I don't know if anybody's driven in there, but it is huge what they're building in terms of expanding the capacity for veterans. And they are um, extended living or assisted living quarters, group homes. So it's going to be single story and, you know, it's multiple people sharing. Uh, they're going to be able to cook their own food and transition from assisted living into the other aspects of the VA hospital. It'll be a huge economic impact for us because of the staff uh, needed. So going back to this building, the future is happening and it is, it, is, it is appearing and disappearing before our very eyes. So this building, like I said, the facade has come off this last, last year and it's now been painted. Um, it's for sale. And so um, the, the windows up above, they're beautiful. They're the old leaded glass that has started to turn purple uh, and they were able to save those, preserve them. When they tore off the wood face facade on it, there were lots of bats living in there. So bats lost their houses. Um, another thing here is our lovely El Cortez Theater. The El Cortez sign is, is not the original, but it is, a, is a, it is an exact replica of the original one. It was just put back on the building a few years ago. And just since this photograph was taken, um, they painted it. And if you've been up there on Main Street to see the new paint job. So things are, are changing right before our eyes. Uh, and then we have the wonderful Healing Arts, um, Healing Waters Plaza in terms of economic development. Here is the uh, Morning Star Outfitters. This used to be an old Piggly Wiggly grocery store, the big windows. So um, they've gotten it. I hope they, I would love for to put something up in that sign above. They did do one thing is they painted over most of a lovely mural that was on the side of the building. They did leave two little sections, this one, and there's another one with a little bunny. Um, and then down on Broadway, this building is interesting for a couple of reasons. It also got recently painted um, a two story. And if you'll notice again, you've got uh, the doors on the front. So there was a porch here. Delmas Howe, um, this was owned by his grandfather. He grew up in this house. Um, he wasn't born in it, but he grew up in it. And um, he said that when there was that porch on there, they could sleep outside. And on a second, another second story diagonal across Broadway, and it's still there, was a second story that had a porch on it. And the two um, grandmothers of these two families, that was the, I don't know which one was which, but one of the liquor, the liquor family and the gambling family were in their porches and they couldn't stand each other and they would glare at each other. Um, and again, I want to just point out there's the turtle motif showing up. And this also had the wooden facade that was put on it, was taken off about two years ago, which again made me realize, okay, we're going to lose these facades eventually and they will be gone. And it was a really fascinating green. You can still see little bits of it here. And there's a little bit there that they didn't cover up. Um, I asked, this is building zone by Sid Bryan, and I asked him if he would repaint it um, because it needed to be painted to stabilize the wood, maybe close to the same color that it was because that color is supposed to have been brought, extra paint brought down from the dam um, that was used in that. Uh, so it, again, had historical significance. But um, just the fact it got painted and is being taken care of is, is good. Um, and then this is a quick murals. This is another Reed Ritchie. And we're very close to the end. There's a um, more of a shot. I love how it just goes. He's captured a lot of the blue in the sky. And then we all know the influence of this incredible, the uh, Truth of Consequences Brewery has had on town, giving us a nightlife, giving people a place to meet, giving people from different um, avenues and parts of town to come and hang out. and the excuse me, the bodega right next to them. And then this is the old Amons, Amons building. It was a furniture store. Uh, they moved out a few years ago, but it is now the Turtleback co-working space. So it's bringing in an aspect of economic development 
uh, an environment that um, there's no other facility like this in all of south of I-20, I-40 in, in New Mexico. It's the only co-working space where people come together and share high, latest in technology, high internet speed, uh, sharing meeting facilities and such. And